Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's uh, great to have you back um, and uh, delighted to kick off day three uh, of this event um, where we have a lot of really good material um, prepped for you um, that's going to, to really get going this morning and continue through the day. Um, we are, Mohammed and I talked quite a bit about uh, trying to optimize some of the aspects of the schedule today to deliver value. Um, and this afternoon, um, uh, we'll have uh, some time set aside um, good for project work. Um, we might have a, a, a breakout session uh, for those who are interested specifically in discussing issues with with interfacing the sort of data we've been talking about with simulation models. Um, and um, we have a lot of experience in that in our lab. And whilst our analysis on and discussion of advanced uh, simulation, we'll talk about that a bit, we may go into more detail in a separate breakout session as well. Um, uh, so yesterday, we uh, spent uh, much of the day uh, covering uh, the basics of data sources. And uh, these data sources were um, uh, extremely varied in character, but broadly they had to do with um, uh, background collected data that sensed context. Uh, context from the physical environment, context from the electronic environment through the um, uh, electronic uh, footprint uh, sensors like screen time, uh, app use, and um, f capturing aspects of browsing activity. Okay, um, and uh, by and large, these uh, sensors um, lend context to to understand um, the surrounding uh, situation when people answer questions via surveys or volunteer information via surveys, say via button pushes. They also can be used for triggering uh, in, in some cases. So things like beacons and things like uh, geofencing um, can be used to trigger um, the occurrence of uh, surveys. Um, so uh, those data sources play a strong role. In the afternoon, we proceeded to discuss um, uh, some issues having to do with uh, participant recruitment and human ethics. I had cut down a set of broader set of slides to try to focus on a on a subset of materials, uh, but some really good questions came up that I wanted to help address this morning uh, related to this to uh, supplement those materials in ways that um, uh, there have been interest expressed about. Um, so um, we talked yesterday about um, uh, sensitive studies, studies with uh, those with limited, ag limited agency like minors, cognitively challenged individuals, individuals um, who are in uh, certainly medically vulnerable situations, uh, those with HIV AIDS, uh, uh, those struggling with um, uh, mental health challenges, suicidal ideation, um, et cetera. Um, I should have noted uh, some of the um, some of the roles. Uh, there's some unique characteristics also with inpatient populations um, and uh, in needing to be um, cautious in the context of working with patients uh, for, who are who are inpatients, say in a hospital uh, or in a mental health facility. Um, or individuals who are frequent outpatients. Um, uh, and uh, we have a fair degree of experience with this across many studies. Um, uh, there's some uh, special um, uh, needs and special opportunities that come in there. One has to be very careful from an ethics perspective to make sure the clinician-patient relationship isn't seen as being in any way compromised or limited by um, uh, by this relationship. So uh, it's very important for ethics boards often that that um, the offer to participate in a study uh, by a clinician be offered without any um, um, any degree of concern by the patient that this might 
uh, that them declining participation might compromise um, the relationship between them and their cl uh, clinician. This is a frequent thing for RCTs, for randomized control trials and other needs as well, but it comes up in this area. Um, uh, we have found that um, uh, the clinical environment and the, um, the inpatient environment more particularly can offer a great location for when you're working with wearables um, and where you can help patients set up with wearables, for example, um, because of the added level of contact. Um, uh, it can provide some extra support for things like uh, recharging phones and helping to maintain them. Um, uh, and often there's a very ready network that can be used for getting the data very quickly back to the Ethica servers. Um, Mohammed, I don't think, talked about it, although he showed the screen in Ethica. Um, but um, Ethica does have an option for rapid upload of data. Um, so within the Ethica app, in the settings area, so if you go to kind of the, the menu in the upper left and you do settings, um, uh, there's, um, there's a set of options with, with respect to upload. For example, to limit uploading to when you're charging the phone, to um, upload via Wi-Fi only. That's something that can be set for a study as a whole or on a per phone basis. And then rapid upload option. And in a clinical setting, often we have that network to allow us to rapidly upload um, data. Um, I'm gonna be talking um, per Brianna's uh, question yesterday uh, about provision of phones by studies. I will say in an inpatient setting or a setting with frequent outpatient contact, it's very easy to provide phones and indeed retrieve phones um, that are uh, provided. And uh, the fact that the participants are local allows you to uh, work with them more closely and often deal with uh, any issues that come up um, more readily. Um, so this is a special type of study that, that does come in to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, it, it raises both ethics um, uh, issues and um, in planning uh, issues. Um, that, that need to be taken into account. Um, so um, yesterday, one thing I, I didn't talk about, but it, which it's worth mentioning is um, the phenomena of allowing participants for the sake of raising comfort of ethics boards and to empower participants. For some studies, there, we have offered the option of retrospective or retroactive, um, retroactive participant opt out of a study. And by that, I mean that they can opt out in a way that all their data is from earlier is deleted. So not only can they pause the, um, the data collection going forward, but they can say, I want out of previous times. And Mo uh, Mohammed had put it to place in an earlier version of Ethica um, a participant dashboard by which for some studies participants would come be able to observe their data and be able to request elision of that data or deleting of that data. So for example, if um, they had neglected to pause the data collection yesterday um, in the context of behavior they'd rather not have re had recorded on the phone they could go back and retrospectively delete data. Um, that functionality is being overhauled right now, but the plan is to, um, to, to fold that into some of the, um, the capacity for participants to interface with the system through the web that Mohammed will be talking about later this morning. Oh, uh, in, in Ethica's future evolution, there's gonna be a huge option for participants to interact via the web with Ethica studies, and this will be one part of it. Brianna, yeah. Um, so this is something, maybe a, a bit of a nitpicky question, but I've been sure. working on this with our ethics application. Totally, totally. Um, and I'm just curious how that works in terms of, like the data is deleted then from the phone, from the servers, Great. and from all Great of the question. server backups. 
Like has the data really disappeared? Okay, this is a <laughs> this is a great question. And and yes, it's 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 highly appropriate. Um uh so certainly um that is uh that that is the goal that I think we would expect that the data would be deleted from databases but also from backups but this that does require an additional level of uh, back and forth so I, I want to ask Mohammed what the plans are for that in the short term um, so so we can comment so uh, the data will be deleted uh, from everywhere that we store the data mm -hmm. uh, and from the backups as well so the data will not be stored anywhere uh, one uh, uh, point to consider like it goes really into technical details here though uh, some of these services that store the data like for example like Kibana that we presented yesterday because uh, they, they wanted to really uh, improve the performance of the system they implemented an approach called Add only, uh, uh, add only um, data is storage. What it means is that when you, you can only add the data, you can't remove it. Uh, you can remove it, but what they do is that they just add another record on top of this, saving that, saying that this record is deleted, which basically is not the same as deletion. This is exactly how internally the systems work. When you say go somewhere and say delete this data. They don't delete it internally, they just mark it as deleted. So when you query it, they say, okay, this shouldn't come uh, in the results because it's deleted. Then every few months, a process happens like an overnight called compaction that goes through it, like when the load on the system is lower, and actually deletes everything from the disk. So uh, now, the reason it's important is that if, 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 um, when we do call the delete on all these systems, but they actually don't delete it right away. Now, unless that we actually call a compaction uh, procedure after every delete, which in that case the system performance would be a lot slower than what it is. But when it, the delete is called, uh, maybe shortly after, or the, the, anything between one to three months after, the data completely will be erased from the disk as well. And as soon as the, this command is called, the data will not be accessible anymore. So, so I appreciate Mohammed's uh, fulsome answer there. Um, as Mohammed notes, um, we're dealing with technologies um, upon which different systems are built, including Ethica. Um, and a very common example of that is with disks, where you know there, there's disk storage, and um, and when you delete a file, it makes it incomparably more more er uh, effort intensive to go back and find any evidence of it. But for at least a certain amount of time, often after you delete it, there is some residual data. So if someone were to capture the disk and look, in principle, they might be able to track down some, some hints of what was there before. Um, and indeed, you know, in, in law enforcement, forensic investigations, that goes on, that people nominally delete a file and someone grabs it. When you're dealing with encryption and encrypted data stores, it's, it's even more involved because if someone got the disk, they couldn't make sense of what was there. And, um, but um, from what I'm hearing from Mohammed at a broad level, data is systematically deleted from all places, but there may be a delay in realizing that deletion. A good example of that is that when you delete a file from your computer, it's actually not deleted. If it exactly. was completely deleted, it would be impossible to restore it. But you know that there are a lot of services out there that restore the content of the deleted disk, right? The reason is that when you delete a file, just the, exactly. uh, the name that points that file is deleted, which basically tells the system that this space is free to use in the future. But the content that was there previously is still there. Mm -hmm. So you can give it to a professional and they go through that and they try to figure out what was there before. Uh, the same technology applies to, to databases as well. When you delete something, it doesn't immediately delete it. But this, this is like very much into technical details of how exactly delete happens. But in terms of like us deleting the data from the backups and from the, from the database, yes, that is. And one thing I have to mention is that we specify in our, in our privacy policy that we delete all the instances that we have, but you can go and export the data 
and then participants should contact the research staff separately in case that they have exported data elsewhere. So those instances also get it. Yeah, thanks very much. That's uh, really helpful. Was, did, did that address your question, sir? And uh, per comments earlier, um, having that sustained conversation with Mohammed or yourself later today, um, if this is something you want to know more about, you know, that could be a subject for for further discussion there. Um, uh, okay, um, I did want to um, uh, just address one or two other questions that had come up uh, yesterday. Um, uh, one was the issue of of ins of of. I say here incentives. The word incentives is is a poor choice for for my coverage here. Um, it's um, I'm using it in a very colloquial sense, but it's a sense to which uh, human ethics boards are actually rather, rather sensitive, saying this is an incentive versus this is a compensation for someone's time or a um, or a thank you, um, uh, you know, uh, an expression of thanks on the part of the researcher. Incentives are a term that um, that is fighting words for some for some ethics boards. I found, and um, and therefore it's it's a poor um, a poor choice of mine to to list this there. But I'm using it in a colloquial sense to ask what draws someone to participate in this study and are there things that we can do to, to um, further motivate them to participate? Um, and uh, there are cases of studies we've run where participants have been interested in engaging with their own data. Um, uh, and uh, in, in other studies, we've provided non-monetary motivations, things like, um, uh, a card to uh, to go to a local coffee shop or um, phone cards um, that will cover um, uh, data charges. Um, uh, we've we've also provided uh, uh, raffles in some of the earlier studies in which Mohammed was was involved. Um, I think one of Ethica's earliest studies, or one of Ethica's predecessors' earliest studies, we raffled off an iPod, I think, which was a prized item at that time, um, as I recall. Um, uh, in other cases, participants are drawn by the ability to share on community sites, to contribute to their community development and um, uh, you know, to, to contribute in a positive way to their community. So I mentioned the uh, very forward-leading visionary study led by uh, Tarun Kadapali called the SMART study, which really leverages that uh, to great effect um, within uh, this province. Um, there are uh, quite a few studies where we have compensated people's time and um, contributions <laughs> in a way that's based on their degree of involvement or participation. So we, we uh, uh, provide them a certain uh, amount, say on a per study basis that they've, or sorry, per survey basis that they've answered, um, but chosen those to be such that they're never inimical to health. For example, um, if there's a study which is looking at um, uh, cigarette and e-cigarette use. We don't want to incentivize someone to report more cigarette use, for example. Um, and uh, the idea is to design systems which provide compensation for, um, for involvement, say for answering surveys that are asked of them, um, popped up and asked of them, while avoiding uh, adversely affecting their, their health um, choices. Um, and uh, this has been highly successful. Um, I believe a study that Mohammed has been involved with, which is going to be rolled out at a, a multi-thousand person level, um, uh, used, um, used sort of schemes uh, very much based on this um, and achieved very high levels of, um, of, of involvement. 
Sonny Cheryl um, uh, delivered. I believe it also had um, measures of, of completeness of response that were rewarded and a number of other of our studies have as well. It requires a research assistant to do a computation or some code to, to do a compensation to, to reward participants. And in some cases, I think that's an automatic method. It, Mohammed, for that study, was that automatic? It would, it would compute the, comp the compensation due participants? The, the one that involved time use. Yes. 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 Um, and uh, in other cases, with lower SES populations, we have provided uh, smartphones, sometimes with accompanying data plans as uh, a comp compensatory arrangement or as incentives. The risk here is coercion. On the part of the ethics board, they may say, look, if you're offering a homeless person a smartphone, how are they going to say no? Or you're giving them a data or a plan, a phone plan, can they realistically turn that down? And if so, have you not morally compelled that participant to participate despite nominally being able to decline? Um, uh, and so within the low SES context, um, uh, there's some concerns involving coercion that are, are non trivial about wanting to avoid um, putting someone in a position that they, uh, because of life circumstances, they, they can't reasonably uh, turn down. Um, we, um, we have had a lot of experience with data plans and offering data plans. Um, my overall comment here is um, if you can do it, in a uniform way across all phones, pair them with data plans and give them out, that's, that's okay. Um, but often we find certain participants want to use their own phone and, and they're with this carrier, these other participants are with that cellular carrier. And providing a data plan that works for a given participant may be quite tricky because you're dealing with 10 different carriers with different data plans, some have unlimited, some have you know, two gigabyte per per month, and and it's it's it, it can get into a a confusing situation with because of all the different you know combinatorial possibilities with their carriers and 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 data plans, etc. So one has to be careful promising data plans, and if you're going to do so, try to do so in a way that you know exactly the carrier and the data plan that's going to be used for all participants. Otherwise, it can, it can get uh, challenging. For low SES participants, um, often there may be limited Wi-Fi access, but Ethica runs for days off, offline and, and longer, probably weeks. It could run offline. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if you're not in need of data streaming in every few hours or, you know, well, once a day, if you're willing to lead, live with a couple days between getting data from participants, um, Wi-Fi may still be a, a good option because a lot of individuals who do have smartphones seek out Wi-Fi. Um, you know, they'll go to a public library or they'll uh, go to a public building where there is Wi-Fi. So the point is, even in low SES populations, our observation is that Wi-Fi contact for someone with a smartphone, it typically occurs every few days. And if you can live with that, that's good. If, you, if every few days is too little and you want to start reminding people after just a day of not hearing from them, that could be more of a problem and you should think about data plans. Um, but um, you know, that's, uh, this is, has special considerations for, for uh, low SES population. It used to be that Ethica, there were a lot of concerns about Ethica imposing overage charges on participants. The idea is that if participants had a really uh, lean data plan, um, that Ethica might lead to charges being socked to them, um, and that that might disincentivize people. That's retreated as an issue because number one, Ethica does allow both participants 
and study designers to specify this option of not um, of not allowing anything but Wi-Fi access, of, of mandating it's only uploaded with Wi-Fi. So that's one thing. Um, a second thing is data plans have expanded in their coverage. But a third thing is these days um, the, the availability of streaming services, um, the use of video by uh, those on smartphones is so ubiquitous. Whether it's you know Hulu or or uh, YouTube or FaceTime or all these different services that people are routinely using, the amount of data Ethica collects is pretty small peanuts compared to that. And so it's literally not an exaggeration that on a Saturday morning, a teenager will probably use far more bandwidth than Ethica will across an entire month for most studies, despite the fact that Ethica is collecting big data from an epidemiological standpoint. So these issues have tended to retreat some. Uh, Brianna asked yesterday about participant-owned smartphones versus study-owned smartphones. And this used to be our bread and butter uh, type of issue. Um, because we have run dozens of studies with, with study-owned smartphones. We've also run many dozens of studies with, with uh, participant-owned uh, smartphones. Um, we still do provide study smartphones for certain studies, um, particularly those involving, um, involving uh, lower SES participants. Um, uh, those involving inpatient populations um, where um, it's a very controlled environment like a, a mental health facility, um, a regional psychiatric center, et cetera. Um, now, there's some real trade-offs here uh, between these. Most studies that we run these days um, tend to be largely participant-owned and most of the time entirely participant on smartphones. Why? People have a natural incentive to retain them. They know the phone, they're comfortable with it, and it's woven into their daily life. It's a phone that often they feel good about. Um, the challenge with this for low SES populations is sometimes you have phones that are economy models or older models that are low on space, somewhat low on performance, and they have a, a screen size which is smaller. Um, and, um, and, and that can be a downside. I say switching phones is an issue here. It's not, a, it's not an issue for Ethica as long as they install the app right now on the new phone. Um, particularly it will be less and less of an issue with the web-based survey because that can, even if they switch phones and don't install the app on the new phone, they can still be answering surveys via a browser, even without the new app. But if they switch phones, um, there may be you know, several days where their data is not coming in, and you might want to be aware of it. Ethic has a very nice way of keeping track of multiple devices for a given person, so it's not a problem there, but sometimes you lose them for a couple days because they just forget to install the app. That's retreating as an issue because of this web-based survey and the availability of SMS-based and email-based reminders, which is, is something Mohammed will be, he, he it's, he's shown some parts of that now with the email-based reminders. SMS-based reminders are going to be uh, an important uh, reminder mechanism, um, which will help remind people to answer surveys even if they're on a new phone and even if they do so with browser. So switching phones is retreated as an issue. Um, and, and then participant owns smartphones to the degree you're dealing with data plans, you know, it, it gets complicated because they have different plans associated with their phone. This, this again is less of an issue now because of the, the, level of, the, the level of data collected by Ethica is small compared to streaming, um, streaming entertainment. Okay, um, uh, and, and communication, streaming communication. 
So phones, study provided phones. Um, we do a lot, we have done dozens of studies like this. You can select an effective model. Sometimes this, uh, we used to select effective models, particularly according to price point. You know, a, a model that was cheap, but offered, um, you know, a, um, a suitable set of functionality. Um, over time, um, that has, as the number of options, particularly in the Android side, uh, has risen. Um, uh, what we find ourselves uh, looking at is often now more features like biometric security. Um, so if the ethics board is extra comfortable or your sureness of a phone being in possession of a participant is extra sure by having it uh, fingerprint protected, for example. Um, you may want a model that, that allows that. Or maybe you want phones which have humidity, temperature, and pressure sensors because you're doing work with nosocomial infection spread in a facility and you want to know something about the um, humidity and the temperature of the environments to which participants are exposed. Um, you can, if you're in an inpatient facility, you may want to hand out phones that, that have these extra sensors. Um, here you can choose telecommunications provider. Um, you can ensure you're starting with adequate space. The cons here are pretty notable, um, and it's sobering. Um, three years ago, four years ago, in some work with Harvard, um, uh, I remember vividly, this is work with lower SES populations, you know, being surprised that some of the participants were turning down our phones. They said, you know, we don't want your stinking Android phone. Um, you know, I'm an iPhone user. And that's, that's a reality, that, uh, that among low SES populations, there are preferences. But more than that, some of those participants um, said, my phone is better than your phone. <laughs> I'm not going to take your phone. You know? um, and um, if you're standardizing around a phone, um, that can be challenging. Um, it can be costly. Phones are not as expensive as they used to be, but they're not cheap particularly, you know, more expensive models. Um, and uh, this last one, risk of non-return, um, it, 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 it's a major issue for certain subpopulations. We've, we've had a number of phones go missing. There's some really funny stories associated with this. Um, um, one phone ended up, um, uh, ended up uh, being being taken back to Persia and disappearing somewhere in that country. Um, another phone um, was taken by the um, was taken by a participant, and we we could actually see the participant <laughs> driving around Saskatoon on the ring road and so on. And so we knew where it was, but um, we didn't go after it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was it was quite interesting. Um, uh, other phones have been um, stolen, have been damaged, have been lost, have been um, impounded by the police. Um, so that, that case of the, uh, car, the vehicle which had uh, narcotics in it and where the participant fled the police who seized the vehicle. And the phone was then, for a number of days, sending out signal in a uh, impounded car lot, I think, um, in the police impounded car lot, and we never got it back. What we have found is for low, for very vulnerable populations, those, for example, struggling with mental health and, and particularly addictions issues, those uh, intravenous drug use populations, those working with intoxication problems, non-return of phone is a serious issue. Um, we did find to reach out to them, we needed to provide them a phone. We did not receive, many of those phones we did not receive back. And Tina can tell you uh, a little bit more about that if you're interested. But we had uh, real challenges with that population as far as keeping phones. The spirit was willing, but the environment was so adverse they, they lost them. Okay? Um, yes, Brandon. Yes. 
to a community sample, maybe not a, a high risk or highly vulnerable right. sample, but um, thinking about some of the same issues around not return or yeah. Um, yeah. familiarity, I don't know if you have experience with that. Yeah, we do. Uh, so, so we do hand out wearables uh, within certain groups. We've, we've done work with that um, um, in a number of studies. Uh, and we, we haven't had as big an issue with that. Um, uh, maybe it's because the wearables we've dealt with were predominantly less intrusive things like uh, you know, wristbands and so on. Um, they were pretty easy to maintain, keep on a person. Um, uh, so uh, there, we, we haven't had big challenges. Um, yeah, th okay, very good question. That is part of the incentives for a lot of these studies is you get to keep the phone or the wristband. And if you consider the depreciation rate for phone, for a longer study, that's a very reasonable thing. You know, if, it's, if the study is a year or two or duration and they get to keep the phone after it, often it's simultaneously a, um, a, a a uh, very attractive uh, incentive, and it's a, um, and it, it means less disruption for them when they end the study, and it's more incentive for them to maintain it. So, so you're absolutely right. Like with the wristbands, um, that's something which uh, uh, can be a draw to maintain it, keep it, um, keep it, you know, properly, uh, properly maintained, etc. What we have had is, and, and it, I, I'm not sure how much it's operated for wristbands, I've wondered about it, has had issues of phones which were provided to family members, unbeknownst to us. Someone else took the phone and, and used it as if it were their own, uh, even though nominally it was associated with, you know, a person of, opposite or you know, different gender and so on. Um, it was in fact taken by a family member. Um, and same thing I would imagine for wristbands sometimes, uh, there may be a risk that the wristband is being used by someone else. I know my colleagues who run large accelerometer studies have told me stories about, you know, people who, you know, teenagers are <laughs> challenging because they often are mischievous uh, in their intentions and, you know, they, They've done things like uh, taken um, actigraph accelerometers and put them on their dog and, and had the dog run around the field and experience huge acceleration and, 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 and given the impression that you know the participant is engaged in massive <laughs> physical activity when really it's a canine in origin. Um, and uh, you know, I, I imagine that for, for wristbands, or for uh, wearables, that it could be that they'd be of interest more to certain family members sometimes than the participant, and, and mischief like that could be done. But we haven't had problems with, with wristbands when we've handed them out. Um, but, uh, you know, those, are, those studies are small, and, and by small end, I mean, um, the count of studies where we've done that is small enough that you know, uh, it's more anecdotal on my part. We haven't had the problem we have with, with phones. Uh, so, so that's what I'd say. I'd say it's less of an issue than with phones. Phones are, um, um, are, are also very desirable. You think about a, a lowest, uh, you think about a very vulnerable population like individuals struggling with drug addiction on the street. A phone is very attractive, um, a target for theft because it can be picked up and used by someone to for immediate goals and it has a certain um, uh, uh, it has these uh, the ability to be used in all sorts of ways very flexibly and uh, sometimes it's an advantage that someone else's phone in that sense you won't get blamed if you know there's drug deals made with it or something like that whereas wristbands tend not to be as uh, as uh, as much of an issue, they're they're more special purpose function devices, and so um, and same thing with a lot of wearables. You know, it it might offer limited. It's hard to imagine 
someone else having a hankering for you know a hexo shirt or something or or really really coveting that um, you, you know that uh, that chest strap that measures heart rate variability. Um, I guess it can occur, but um, you know uh, those uh, those things I think are rare. So so study provided phones. I, I will say this: um, study provided phones. Ten years from now, five years from now, um, I expect that we will still be doing some study provision of wearables and smart and smartphones are there. Their evolved um, uh, descendants, which will probably, you know, will be very interesting devices. The point is, I don't see this going away. What I see it is getting more specialized. When do we do this? It's for certain populations, certain very defined circumstances. When we started this business, um, we were handing out devices. That was the standard way you did it. You, to deliver a study, you would hand out devices. It went part and parcel of it. And Mohammed. Um, engaged in a lot of that. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, there's some great stories there. Um, Mohammed triggered a bomb alert on campus one time, but um, <laughs> um, and uh, and it was because of devices that we handed out and placed in, in locations. <laughs> Uh, in any case, there's some great, great stories. Uh, I don't think this is going away. It's getting more specialized. It's getting more particular. And I think with wearables, um, some of the studies that we work with uh, send out wearables via a mail and have them returned via mail. Mm -hmm. That's a very viable strategy, I think. Um, uh, it does have to be policed, or that's not the right word. It has to be supported by reminders and and so on but you know circulating wearables is something that can um, that can really be cost effective you you rotate them among participants and in general this this sorry I should have mentioned another scheme that that recurs in a lot of our studies you have a broader study and then you have a subset of that study and potentially a rotating subset which undergoes a specially focused data collection. Um, Cheryl's study with foodborne illness, for example, actually had, had uh, a phenomenon that we see in a lot of studies, which is a defined period of time, like a week, where you say, you know, win one for the gipper. Um, during this week, we're going to be bombarding you with messages. Please know that it's only going to last a week. Try to keep up with it. Um, and after the week, you know, you'll have, you'll have done your duty, um, or you'll have uh, completed your, 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 your big task here, and it won't happen again. A lot of studies, that's a really good way to set expectations, retain people despite um, a lot of pressure. They know it's going to be over in a few more days, and they know from the start that, um, that they're going to be asked to, to help out a lot during some particular time periods. In other studies, we'll do that with wearables. So we'll ask them to carry a wearable for a subset of time. Or you have, of the whole study, a subset of people who are particularly willing to volunteer their time and effort carrying wearables. And it's a sub-cohort that you use to figure out you know, um, uh, some of the day-to-day -day patterns that uh, are, are lost for, for the broader set of cohort, but you capture via the wearables, and then you try to generalize to the broader study. Um, often harder to do, but, um, but with the rotation to different sub-cohorts, it uh, you know, can be uh, very effective. So I would say um, this whole picture of like providing phones to a subset of people or providing wearables to a subset of people has various combinations can be very effective, including temporarily limited uh, rotations. Okay. Um, uh, um, so I noted some considerations for, for inpatient populations. I'm conscious of the time. We have some really exciting material coming up, but I want to talk very briefly about uh, certain items that are um, of great significance for most studies. So what I'm going to do is stop this uh, recording so we can pr 
uh, place this in a separate video. And this is going to be some brief comments on um, uh, on uh, budgets and time one. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, some comments also um, on the uh, a frequent question that we've gotten in some context to wit um, questions about